Good to see you in church this evening, and uh, maybe we'll sing Showers of Blessing, huh? And uh, got caught in the rain there a little bit, some of you, and uh, but it's glad you made it through. We're Baptists. We don't let the water bother us, amen, and uh, especially rain. Good to see you in church tonight. Looking forward to a good service together this evening. Well, take your Bible, and let's go to Luke chapter 6, okay? I, I, uh, we were, you say, I thought we were done with the apostles. Well, we were. But uh, we're going to have a couple more lessons probably on the disciples and, uh, of Christ and some things I think that is helpful for us to know. Uh, these, are, these are some wonderful men chosen by God. And, uh, you know, the, their, the, did you get this timeline, by the way, in your... Oh, uh, that's, really, that's really interesting. I hope you take time to look at that. I know it's small print, but that's actually blown up. Uh, and you understand, you, you'd go the first line, come back, and the second line, come back, go to third line, okay? It, 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 if, that, if we didn't do that, it would have a piece of paper this long, all right? So we're trying to, to make it so you can see it. But if you notice, it's very interesting. You see it is bap- Jesus baptized and the, the, the dove coming upon him, and then two of the disciples begin to follow. He goes 40 days in the wilderness. That's all in the fall of 27 A.D., when you go below that, and you look in the spring of 29 A.D., that's when you begin to see, if you notice about the third column over there, the 12 disciples ordained, and the Sermon on the Mount is given. And Matthew gets called and some other people during that time. So you understand, when we talked about how Christ had had probably about 18 months of ministry before he called his disciples. Uh, I'm not sure that I ever realized that. I always thought that they were called early on and that they were with him the entire time. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case here. You see the things that took place uh, before uh, Jesus ever called the twelve. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, uh, the timing of that. But I thought that would be interesting for you to look at and study sometime to see when things took place and uh, when the different miracles t- happened and things like that. I just thought that was an interesting little piece of information to have, all right? Well, Luke chapter 6, if you have that there, and I'm going to start with verse number 12. The Bible says, it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. Now, Father, we pray for tonight as we once again study the Scriptures, uh, dealing with these men that you chose to be your disciples and whom you named to be apostles. And Lord, I pray that you'll guide and direct in our study tonight, open our understanding of your word. And Lord, give us a greater appreciation of these men and what you did with them and what you did through them, and certainly what you desire to do in us and through each one of us in our generation. And so Lord, bless our study of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Jesus has ministered for about 18 months when he selects 12 to be his disciples. He, he knows his earthly mission is going to end. It's going to end in his death, his resurrection, and then his ascension back to the Father. And then he's going to have to turn things over to somebody. And he's going to choose 12 that he's going to turn it over to. And now he's going to focus really the, the last 18 months or so of his ministry, of his time on earth, into training and teaching these 12. So they're equipped and they're ready to carry on the work once Jesus ascends back to heaven. They're going to be his spokesmen. They're going to be his representatives to carry on the work. And so he's going to train these men. Now, number one is the choosing of the 12. That's what we read here in Luke chapter 6. The choosing of the twelve. Did you notice what happened before he chose twelve in verse 13? Did you notice what happened in verse number 12? It came to pass in those days he went out into a mountain to what? 
to pray. And he continued, how long? All night in prayer to God. So before the choosing takes place, Christ spends the night in prayer. This was not an unusual thing for him. Look, look uh, one chapter earlier, Luke 5, and notice verse number 16 where the Bible says he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. There was a fame going around about him. In verse 15, uh, great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him, but he withdrew himself. Jesus never sought the crowds. He never sought to get a big crowd. Just the opposite of us. Everybody wants a big crowd, you know. He seemed to want to get away from the crowd most of the time. And he always would draw himself and go to pray. Now, I want you to notice we see what we see here is, number one, the humanity of Christ in that he went to God in prayer. He humbled himself. He went to God in prayer just like we would. What do we do when we're facing big decisions? Well, I hope you pray. I hope you, you feel the great need and the great burden to go to God and say, God, I need help, whether it's wisdom, whether it's uh, provision, whether it's guidance, whatever it is, you say, God, I, I don't know what to do. And I don't know how I'm going to, to, to do this task. I need your help. And so he, he goes to God just like we would. Now, it's interesting. He spent all night in prayer to God that the Bible would tell us that. And it's interesting. Now, it takes several of our words to say all night. But in the, in the language the Bible was written in there, it's one word. And, and uh, that one word literally means toiling all night at a task. Toiling all night at a task. In other words, and it was all night. Now you understand the you understand they only had two they they had day and night. Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in a day? So there were twelve hours in a day. Day was from six AM to six PM. Uh, at six PM it's like our midnight. At at twelve oh one tonight it'll be Thursday morning. All right? At six oh one PM it's Thursday morning for the Jew. Okay? So it's right now, it'd be already Thursday. Okay? Because it's at 7.30 in the evening. Now, so he's saying there's 12 hours in a day. Well, there's 12 hours at night. You remember when Jesus came walking on the water, he came in the third watch of the night. There were three watches in the night from 6 to 9 p.m., 9 p.m. to midnight, midnight to 3 a.m., 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. When he came on the fourth watch tonight, I think it was, it was between 3 and 6 in the morning. So when he prays all night, He's praying for quite some time. And the word isn't just he prayed part of the night or he prayed some of the night. The, the word that's used here is, is toiling at something. It's, it's working at something. It's applying yourself to a task. It, it, the word can't be used for I slept all night. Okay, can't be used for just something passive. Or, or it was dark all night. Okay, can't be used that way. It had to be it, it, something you exerted yourself doing somewhere 8 to 10, maybe 12 hours of prayer. Literally pouring himself out to God. You know what that is? That's his humanity. Showing us and being an example for us how important it is to pray before you make big decisions. And that's praying. Sometimes I've mentioned this before when somebody says, I've really prayed about this. I, I like to probe a little bit and see what you mean by that. Do you mean this? Do you mean that you skipped some meals to pray? Do you mean that you gave up some sleep to pray? What, what exactly do you mean I've really prayed about it? Jesus prayed all night. But I also see his deity because Jesus had says he continued all night in prayer to God, yet I understand something and so do you. He is God. He's God in the flesh. God with us, Emmanuel. And so, I uh, understand it's, the, uh, it's, it's God talking to God. In other words, it's the Trinity communing with itself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so, with that important choice to be made, Jesus spends 8 to 10 hours or maybe 12 hours in prayer. Now, was he praying for himself? No. Did, did he know what he's going to do? Sure, he's God. On the, on the God side of things. But I think, I think he was praying for the ones he's going to choose. I think he was praying for them. They're going to need the help. They're going to need the, 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 the help of God. And so 
he's going to pray for those whom he would choose. Now, the question always is, why did he pick 12? Why not 8? Why not 6? Why not 15? Why the number 12? Well, we know that there were 12 tribes of Israel. We understand that. And, and Israel, though, has become apostate at this time. They're uh, very corrupt. They, uh, they're they're uh, a far cry from what God intended for them to be in the Old Testament. And so, uh, Jesus actually, I think, by choosing 12, I believe, was sending a message that He's establishing a new covenant. And He's establishing a new order here with these 12 disciples, there are going to be 12 apostles. In fact, they're going to judge the 12 tribes. Uh, in, you're in Luke 6 there. Just hold your finger there and, and turn over in Luke to Luke 22. Would you look in Luke 22? The, the disciples are having their discussion again about who's going to be the greatest and such, and Jesus has to teach them about being a servant. And he tells them in verse number 27, For whether is greater, the, he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Yet, they are, yet are they which have continued with me in my temptations, ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom. As my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, doing what, church? Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So, it became very clear to any Israelite, the number twelve there, that, they were, that, that he was here to set up a kingdom. Now, it wasn't what they expected. They thought he was going to set up the kingdom now. They wanted a Messiah right now. And when they heard he chose 12, boy, the signal was loud and clear. <laughs> well, Jesus was going to establish a kingdom, but it was far different than what they were anticipating. It's a kingdom that was not of this world, all right? So that's the choosing of 12. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, the changing of the names. The changing of the names. In verse 13, it says, He called unto him his disciples, and of them... He chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, disciples. Did you notice he called unto him the disciples, and of them he chose twelve? There wasn't just twelve that came to him. There were many disciples at that time that gathered around him and, and were listening to him. Uh, not just the, the twelve. Now, we know disciple means a student or a learner. A student or a learner. It was not uncommon in Jesus' day for rabbis or teachers to attract students. Uh, they would want to come and sit. Gamaliel was a famous teacher of that day. And people would say, we sat at the feet of Gamaliel. The, 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 the teachers, the great teachers of that day were not in a lecture hall, uh, not in a classroom. They were in life. You followed them around and they lived their life and taught you things as they went through life. And that's what Jesus did. He did the exact same thing. Uh, he went place to place and would teach as he went. We don't know how many disciples Jesus had at this point. Or at any point, really, during the time. We know at times, multitudes followed him. We know at one time, he sent 70 of them out two by two to go out and preach the gospel. And so there were times he had numbers of disciples. Um, that's not, it, it's not surprising. Who else, did, who else did they see healing diseases? Who else did they see casting out demons? Hey, who else did they see raising people from the dead? I mean, no one was doing the miracles that he was doing, full of grace and truth, teaching like one who had authority and not as one of the scribes. It's not surprising to me at all that he had multitudes of followers. What is surprising is how could anybody reject him? How could anybody say, no, this guy's not the real deal? That's what's amazing. 
But reject him they did, and they did because his message was more than they could bear. Now, go to John chapter 6. You're in Luke 6. Turn over to John chapter 6. John 6 is a turning point here for many who were following Jesus. It starts out, by the way, in John 6 with the feeding of the 5,000. Now we know that the 5,000 were just the men that were counted. If you counted the women and the children, and each other, we know at least one child was there because the boy had his lunch. He gave his lunch to Jesus. There could have been easily 10,000 there to maybe 15,000 there. And Jesus fed them. You know, it was quite, a, quite an amazing day to be sitting there. Remember, they, 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 Jesus said the days is pretty far spent. I don't want to send them away hungry. Remember, Philip said, come on, man, we 200 penny worth of bread is not enough to give everybody a little bit, a morsel. You know, what are you going to do? And, and, and so Jesus said, we're going to feed them. And so they fed them in, in that miracle. Notice, when that happened, notice the response. Verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Oh, there they are. Hey, this is the guy. This is the prophet. This is the promised one. This has to be him. Understand, what do they spend most of their day doing? Farming? Harvesting? Uh, raising animals? Preparing meals? It's all centered around them trying to get food ready to eat. But what did they just see? Jesus made his own food out of nothing. Hey, this is it. We got it made. No more farming, no more cooking, no more slaving. We just ask Jesus and he prays and we get all the food we want. How cool is this? They just thought this was the best thing in all the world. This is the Messiah I'm looking for. Look at verse 15. You don't think that's true? Look what they said. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force. Why would they take him by force? To make him a king. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. Hey, they're ready to take him and say, you're the king. Put the crown on his head. We're, we're in your kingdom. Man, you're going you're gonna to feed us like this? We're, we're in with you. No more working. We got a life of ease the rest of our life. Because you'll take care of us. And they were ready to make him king. Well, you know what happened. It's dark. They, the disciples went into the sea. They go over in the ship. And that's when the storm comes up. And, and uh, they, Jesus comes to them and said, It's me, not afraid. Immediately they're on the other side. Now they're in Capernaum. And notice the day following, verse 22, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one that wherein his disciples rendered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples in the boat, the disciples were going away alone, and then he talks again of parentheses, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nine of the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people saw therefore, or when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum. Why did they go over to Capernaum? They're seeking for Jesus. Yeah, hey, you know why? It's breakfast time. It's time to eat. Where's that guy who can make food out of nothing? He's the one we want. Notice when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when comest thou hither? And Jesus answered him and said, uh, Verily I say unto you, Ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. I don't know why you're here. You're here because you're hungry. And you want something to eat again. You want me to do the, the, the loaves and the fishes caper again? He said, that's why you're here. So now he's going to tell them, I'm the bread of life. Not this bread that perishes. I'm the bread that's come down from heaven. He's, he's going he's to thin out the crowd. Okay, 
That's exactly what he's going to do. And as he teaches them this, and you go all the way down to verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Notice these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This was his, his, you know, message in the synagogue. This was his sermon of the day. Now these people are eager to follow him. Really, remember, the day before, they're ready to make him king. Now he's given them the eat my flesh and drink my blood sermon. And you see all of them begin to kind of walk away and say, yeah, I'm not so sure about this. What's he talking about? I thought this guy was on the level, man. I thought he was the Messiah. What is he talking about? They didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend it at all. And that's not the kind of message you bring when you want to get a big crowd. And so, notice, they said in verse 60, that many, therefore, of his what? Disciples. Who's listening to him here? His disciples. Not twelve. We don't know how many, but, but many. Because it says many. Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And it is hard to listen to that, isn't it? And, and hard to understand what he's saying. And so Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it. He said to them, Does, th does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Now here he gives the explanation. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits, profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, are they literal? No, they are spirit and they are life. Take the, the spiritual meaning. I'm going to give my body, I'm going to shed my blood for you, for the remission of your sins, for a payment for your sin. It's the spiritual application, not a literal body and blood of Christ. When the Catholics take the wafer and say that's the body and blood of Christ, that's a misinterpretation of John chapter 6. They're not understanding that that's spirit, that's life. That's, you're not crucifying the Son of God fresh every time you take the communion. Okay? So, their spirit, they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, and he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And here we go. From that time, many of his disciples did what? Went back and walked no more with him. Oh, they've been following him around. And when he healed people, that was great. When he, when he cast out demons, that was great. Hey, when he made food out of nothing, that was wonderful. But when he says that I have to accept him dying for me and his blood being shed for me, wait a minute, what's he talking about? I'm a good person. I don't need that stuff. What's he talking about? I'm just a good person and I live right, I'll be okay. Hmm? They didn't like that. And they walked, they didn't walk with him anymore. They didn't follow him anymore. Didn't go and listen to his teaching anymore. And that's why Jesus looked at the twelve. See, then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Okay, fellas, I chose you two. I chose you twelve. Are you leaving too? 
And that's when Peter makes his great statement that, that uh, to whom shall we go, Lord? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So, I want you to understand when he calls the disciples, there, there weren't just 12, there were many disciples. Okay? Now, when he takes these 12, look back at Luke chapter 6 again with me, will you? Luke chapter 6. When he takes these 12 and chooses them after spending all night in prayer, verse 13, when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and, he, and of them he chose 12, whom he also named what? Apostles. Now, he says, I'm going to take you 12 I'm choosing you out of my disciples and you're going to be called apostles. Okay? Now, what's the word apostle mean? That title is very significant. It's, it's from the, the Greek word ap- apostello. Apostello, it means to send out. The noun form of that means one who is sent. An apostle is one who is sent. Sent forth. When we say apostle, that's because our English word is not a translation of that word. It's just a transliteration of that word. Kind of like baptism. The Greek word is baptizo. Well, we just transliterated that and said baptism. Not a, not a translation, but a transliteration. That's why it's apostle. Okay? And so they're called apostles, are sent ones. They weren't just messengers. Angelos is the word for messenger. What word do we get that for? What English word do we get from that? Angel. Angels are messengers. They were messengers sent from God to deliver the message that God would have for them. But they were more than just messengers or couriers. An apostle was like an ambassador. An official representative. That's an apostle. Now, this is interesting, and I just found out this week. There was the language that most people spoke when Christ was here, and the language that Christ spoke as he walked was Aramaic. That was a language that was spoken at that time. And in Aramaic, there is an exact parallel to the word apostle. And it is the word shaliah, S-H-A-L-I-A-H, shaliah. The Shaliah was the official representative of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the ruling council of the Jews. A Shaliah would exercise the full rights of the Sanhedrin. He spoke for them, and when he spoke, he spoke with their authority. He had the full rights of the Sanhedrin. He received the same respect and reverence as the council would if you stood before the council. The Shaliah would never deliver his own message. He only could deliver the message of the council. His job was to deliver the message of the group he's representing. Shaliah. Many prominent rabbis had their shaliahs who taught their message and represented them with full authority. So Jesus is telling his these twelve, you're going to be called my shaliahs, my apostles. You're gonna you're not taking your message. Simon the zealot, you're not taking your message. You're taking my message. And you're not going in your authority, you're going in my authority. You understand the parallel? And, and they, they go, they, they, everyone would have been very familiar with this office or this, this role of Shaliah when Jesus said, these are my Shaliahs, these are my apostles. They would have known they're your official representatives. And they, they come with your authority and they deliver your message. Okay, so disciples and then he named them apostles. Okay? Number three, the charging of the apostles. Now he's going to charge them, and for this I want you to go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, please. 
Are you doing all right? Mark chapter 3. Isn't it great to have a Bible? Study this together. This is Mark's account here. In verse 13, Mark says, He goeth up into a mountain and called unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and have power to heal sicknesses and cast out devils. And then it gives the list of the disciples. All right, so he ordains twelve. This is the same time that he called the disciples, and then he chose twelve, and then he you notice he in Luke it says he called them apostles. Here it says he might send them forth to preach. What's an apostle? One that is sent forth. Okay? Same thing. Now notice though uh, what is what is happening here, the the the, the two step process. Number one, they were to be with him. They were to be with him. Under under his personal teaching his personal tutelage, if you will, and, and training them. He does that in, in Luke 6. And if you remember, I think it's Luke, it's Luke 9 or 10 before he sends them out to preach. Two by two. Several months go by before they're sent. What's going on? He's training them. He's teaching them. He's investing himself into these twelve. You see, he has, he has spent most of the first 18 months with the multitudes and with the many disciples. But now as he knows, my time is drawing short. And these are the men who are going to carry on after I go back to my Father. I've got to invest in them. I've got to train them. I've got to pour myself into them. And, and he, he wants them to go out but he understands that they're going out representing who? Jesus. They're going out. And, and by the way, did it work? Well, do you remember in the book of Acts? They said, these are, these are um, ignorant and unlearned men. The, the, it's really interesting. It's the word, we got a word ignoramus from. That's what they thought of the disciples. But they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Yeah, they're foolish, they're ignorant, but you know who they remind me of? They remind me of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? And you know what? You can't be reminded of someone of Jesus Christ if you never spend any time with them. How can you be like somebody you never spend any time with? So he said, the first thing, fellas, you're going to do is you're going to be with me. That's the number one thing. And by the way, the number one responsibility we have as believers is to be with Him. Sometimes we get the idea that hey, as long as I'm going out and I'm giving the gospel to people and people are getting saved, man, I'm good. Not if you, never, not if you have not been with Him, it isn't. Boy, that's quiet. Number one thing is to be with Him. And if you're with Him then you'll do His work and you'll go out to tell others about Him and they'll see Christ in you. You'll have the power and authority with Him. Before Jesus sent Him out in the book of Matthew, He said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. You're going out in my power. You're going out in my authority. And so His teaching now becomes more intimate and more focused, training the twelve. There'll still be crowds occasionally, sure. But he's focusing on these twelve men. Now, I want you to know that there's a progression here, and I don't know that this is in your notes at all, but there's a progression. Now, I want you to understand this. They, at first, when Jesus called the disciples and called them to follow him, you understand, they would follow them as their schedule permitted. If you remember, when Jesus... I think, it's in, I think it's in Luke 5. He uh, comes in the morning and he's got a multitude following him and he wants to teach them. And Peter is there mending the nets because they've been fishing all night. And he asked to borrow his boat. Remember? See, Peter wasn't out following him. Why? He had to work that night. He had to fish. They, had, they were following him 
as their schedule allowed, as they could, but they kept their jobs, okay? They hadn't, hadn't left that yet, okay? So second, that, that's the first, <clears throat> the first step along the way, all right? So they, they, they would be with a larger group of disciples who did that. The second progression is when he calls them to leave everything and follow him. And then they forsook their nets. They left the business and they followed Christ. He said, follow, hey, from now on you'll follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men. Okay? Then, out of that group that followed him all the time, he chose 12 to call them apostles and personally instruct them and teach them. And then fourthly, he'll give them the authority to send them out to preach the gospel and to preach his word. If you remember, if you remember when, and we'll get to this maybe next week when we get into Acts chapter 1, when they were choosing the replacement for Judas. They, they, they talked about choosing with these men who've been with us from the beginning, going in and coming out. Matthias was one of those. So he was one who was a disciple. He had left all. Was following Christ full time. But he wasn't chosen to be one of the twelve. But he kept following Jesus anyway. He didn't say, didn't choose me. What's the matter? What am I, chopped liver? I'm not good enough to be one of the twelve. I'm, I'm out of here. Huh? Oh no, he just kept following. And, and, and he was there in the upper room. Huh? In the prayer meeting. And, uh, and, and he was chosen to be that uh, disciple, that apostle in the place of Judas. So they might be with him. Then the second part of that is, of course, verse 14. They might be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. I'll say more about this when we get to the charge and the, the commissioning of disciples. We'll talk about their mission, uh, the missions that some of them went on. But... At first, they were short-term mission trips, so to speak, because they'd always return to Jesus. Okay, But when he leaves to go back to his Father, when he ascends in Acts chapter 1, well then, they're going to have to go out on their own for good. And they did. And they did. They're no longer disciples. They're apostles. They're Shalaya. They occupy an important office. Luke calls them apostles six times in Luke and over 30 times in the book of Acts. Common men, but with a very uncommon calling. They'll play a very pivotal role in the founding and in the early leadership of the New Testament church. In fact, they're going to become the channels through which the New Testament's given. The other one being Paul who said, I'm an apostle as one born out of due time. And, and Paul was an apostle. He saw the risen Lord and he was personally sent forth by him. And of course, he gave us much of the New Testament as well. But you understand the... Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Turn there with me, would you please? We're getting down to the end here. Are you all right? Galatians, Ephesians chapter 3. Let's see. Um, Paul is writing here in verse 1, Ephesians 3. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. God says, I'm going to reveal this mystery and I'm going to reveal it to the holy apostles and prophets. So now He's revealing this to the apostles. They're not preaching a human message. 
they're preaching a divine message. They're preaching a message that came from God by direct revelation. That's why, that's why the early church put the apostles' teaching, they put that on a par with Scripture. Acts 2.42, after they got saved day of Pentecost, these continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It didn't say Bible doctrine. It said the apostles' doctrine. They equated that with coming from God. That's the, that's the awe and reverence they had for the apostles. They're the, they were the original Christian teachers and preachers, and it was their preaching and teaching that became the standard by which anybody else's preaching and teaching would be judged. It would all be compared to what the apostles taught. In fact, when the canon of Scripture was being put together, that weighed heavily. Whether the apostles had their approval on a book or whether the apostles were even mentioned in the book. It was very important. Now, I want you to notice something else. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Just of, of noteworthy that I think would be interesting to some. Hebrews 2. Unique power was given to these apostles to perform miracles. That was to confirm that their message was from God. Okay? They did not have a complete scripture. They didn't have a complete Bible like we have. So God was they would have to have confirmation that their word was from God. And most of us are familiar with verse 3 of chapter 2 where it says, How shall we escape <clears throat> if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. So God bore them witness and confirmed them with the miracles. But I want you to look now to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The indication the indication seems to be that it was only the apostles or those very near the apostles that had this ability to work miracles. Notice what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, verse number 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, and wonders, and mighty deeds. So when he says you had patience, you had signs, wonders, and mighty deeds, Paul said those are the signs of an apostle. Not just a sign of any Christian, but the sign of an apostle. Now I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. They had this opportunity to, to confirm their word with the miracles and with the things that God would do to, to confirm that this really was of God. You say, well, does that still happen today? God still does miracles today. But it's not for people to believe His word. You believe His Word by faith. That's, that's the only way you're going to believe it. Not, not because you see some sign. Now let me look at 1 Corinthians 13. The Bible says in verse 8, Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. 
Now abideth faith, hope, and charity these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now when the Bible says in verse 10, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. I believe that's not talking about a person. I think it's talking about the Bible. When that which is perfect is come. The perfect word of God has come. The completed canon of scripture. And now you don't need prophecies. Someone stands up and says, oh, you're going to have this and you're going to have that. No, I, everything God wants to tell me is inside the covers of this book. He's not giving divine revelation to someone about your life. That, that, that's, God's done with that. It's, you don't add to the word. You don't subtract from the word. It's in the book. Okay? And so it's in the Bible. And it, you can have those other things if you want, but Paul said, that's childish. Okay? Uh, when I became a man, I put away a childish thing. I, I got the completed word of God. Now, that means those apostolic signs with the completion of the scripture are not, are not an effect anymore. There's no apostles today, per se. No one's seen the resurrected Christ. Okay? Now, are we sent forth? Yeah. As the Father has sent me, even so send I you. He's sending us forth, and we have the commission to go and preach the gospel. But you haven't seen the resurrected Jesus. We love him even though we haven't seen him. Whom he having not seen, ye love and rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Later on, you find out Paul had to write in Timothy, he said, Trophimus, have I left at Miletum sick? Paul, you're an apostle. What do you mean you left somebody sick? Huh? Why didn't you just heal them? Because those times were over. Those apostolic signs have passed. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying God, the, the days of miracles has passed. God does miracles any, any time in any way He wants. But there's no miracle workers today. Okay? There's only one miracle worker, and that's God. Okay? And, if, and, and so you understand, God does the miracles. And we don't need the signs and wonders to confirm the Word. We just use the Word. Now the apostles were held in very high esteem. Very high esteem by the early church and, and very blessed by the people of God. Now one more scripture to look at. Can you turn to Luke 18? We'll be done. Luke 18. This is the... Uh, story of the rich man that came to Jesus, the rich young ruler, and of course he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. And of course Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, of God. In verse 26 of Luke 18, the disciples then say, heard it and said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. And basically... What Peter's asking is, what do we get? We've left everything. And so Jesus knew that's what he was asking. And notice what Jesus said. Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, our parents, our brethren, our wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. And did God bless them in this life? He sure did. He sure did. They were held in such high regard by the early church and by the early believers. They gained influence and respect and honor by the people of God. And they gained multitudes of spiritual children and brothers and sisters in Christ than what they ever would have had had they stayed by themselves. In fact, do you think had they stayed in their occupation, we'd be talking about them tonight? We're still talking about them. We're still, I don't know, if I, I don't know about you, but I, I look forward to meeting these men. Uh, honestly, I'll be a little embarrassed to meet these men for how little I've done for Christ and how much they did for the Lord. I think I'll be embarrassed a little bit but I'd love to hear them. I'd love to listen to them. Maybe, maybe I can just get close enough to hear them 
and, and listen in on the conversation. But what a great time it'll be when we get to hear him. Now, we'll talk next week, Lord willing, about the cost of a disciple. And then I want to finish up the, Friday, the Wednesday right before missions conference talking about the mission of the disciples and talk about uh, the mission they went on and lead us right into the missions conference. Okay? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening and thank you, Lord, for again our time to, to spend with these men whom you chose out of your disciples to be 12 disciples and from those disciples to be apostles. That they might be with you and that you might send them forth to preach. Wonderful men. Common men. Lord, men that you took and trained and taught and transformed their lives. And Lord, that gives us hope because we're just common people who desire to be taught by you. And so teach us and train us and help us to be able to be sent forth by you with your authority to take your message to a lost and dying world. Help us to be Shalias, sent forth with your authority and with your message. Help us to tell somebody about Jesus this week. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.